Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining me for today's SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. I'm your host, Marty Bennett, and today on the Roundup, we're going to be taking a look at three questions we've been hearing from international educators over the last few days. We're going to get to those questions in just a couple of minutes, but for this first uh, Midweek Roundup of December, December 2nd, uh, we're taking a look at a lot of uh, what it takes to succeed in international education these days. Uh, we're going to take a look at some important uh, uh, fallout from International Education Week, all the data that we've been seeing recently, and also a, a perspective issue, if you will, uh, that I think we all need a reality check on in international education. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to say a special shout out to those watching live here on Facebook. Uh, those watching on repeat on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page, and of course those that are downloading us each week as uh, part of their podcast listening. Uh, we're so glad to have you a part of our journey here at SMIE Consulting, and we hope that we bring some value to you and what you do in your work uh, through our discussion of these international education topics that are so relevant to what we do, uh, and understanding more of the nuances about how we fit in the world uh, in our international education policies at our institutions, at our country, and how, how students respond to those around the world. And that's what we'll talk about today. So as uh, for those not familiar with the Roundup, uh, what we do on Wednesdays each week is we take a look at three news stories or themes we've seen in news stories over the past few days, and we formulate uh, three questions that we attempt to answer and uh, expand upon in our uh, discussions in this half hour on Wednesday afternoon and Eastern time. Uh, but we look at all the stories that we cover are come from our weekly newsletter uh, that comes out Monday mornings, SMIE Consulting's All the SMIE News Fit to Share, and SMIE stands for Social Media and International Education. So we usually cover three to five uh, social media stories, uh, 20 to 30 international education stories, and where those two often overlap. Uh, and that's where we have, um, uh, we find the greatest opportunity for growth amongst uh, many institutions that are looking to grow their international uh, presence on their campuses. So let's get right to the questions. First up is an eternal question we seem to have been asking ourselves uh, in international education here in the United States, particularly for the last four years, but uh, certainly it's worth revisiting. Uh, regularly as part of our uh, attempts to stay in touch with what's going on in the world. Uh, as we, what we say in our, and, uh, in our messaging will be also what we'll talk about a little bit later on. But the question is, are international students still interested in coming to the United States? Uh, now this is, this keeps many international admissions uh, officers up at night, uh, particularly the last few years with what's ha happened with this administration's uh, this out now outgoing administration's policies towards immigration, towards international education that have frankly put quite a, put a negative spin on everything that we do in our work and have forced us to really pivot to playing defense more than we can play offense in terms of promoting the United States as a destination. But uh, a recent uh, data that's come out, and I, I think it's always important in a time where data is readily available and there's so many different types of data that we can uh, we can talk about that the data that matters most is not necessarily where we've been, but where we're going uh, and where students are going. Uh, and part of that comes from an understanding of student motivations. Uh, and that is a very hard thing to keep your finger on because it is a moving target, frankly. But being aware of what the trends are is certainly a, an important piece of the overall success puzzle in international admissions. And my colleagues at IDP Connect, uh, who, with, for whom I, I write occasional articles, uh, do have a, a, a very good uh, system in place to regularly gain uh, feedback from students who are already in the admissions process, as well as students that would be entering the prospective student pipeline uh, very, sort, very shortly. And what, they, what IDP has done is they've, they've had a, a number of different names for this, but uh, they have now uh, had this now third installment of what they're calling IDP Connect International Student Crossroad Research, uh, Crossroads Research. And that looks at the attitudes and behaviors of more than 5,000 international students. And this, the important thing here is who hold current applications and offers 
to higher education institutions across Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK, and the US. So all, all the five major English speaking destination markets. So <clears throat> that cohort, 5,000, uh, is a great representation and there's a regional representation of where those students are from that you can find from the IDP research. But uh, what I think the data shows is something that the, uh, the Pi News article that I'll be dropping the link to in the comments section on the Facebook page certainly makes clear, is that students, that particularly at this point, eight, nine months into the pandemic, who have now offers from these five major English-speaking destination countries from one or more of those countries, they are driven primarily by in-person teaching availability that is a significant factor in where they go. Uh, now this is something obviously uh, this when you see what's happened with Australia we've talked about before New Zealand who have had basically closed borders uh, since March uh, and have not had international students able to come into the country there may be a good proportion of those that might have started the academic year in February uh, with institutions that couldn't get into the country, they started online. But uh, they're, for new students wanting to come to campus, even returning students being able to come back to campus, if they had left at the beginning of the pandemic and weren't already in country before the borders closed, they've been shut out. Uh, that the same is true in China uh, and other uh, countries that have had very restrictive border policies in place uh, to prevent uh, incoming uh, visitors from abroad. Even even some countries um, have made some exceptions for students that there hasn't been those significant flows. But you see what's happened uh, the his, the, the, in the brief history of this pandemic, what has happened is countries that just by the definition of them closing their borders, they're not having students able to enroll. Australia, New Zealand, we've seen that, uh, had significant reductions. Canada had a prohibition on uh, over the summer on if students hadn't already gotten a study permit that was issued before the middle of March, they weren't able to come to Canada if their campus was not uh, fully, did not require them to be in person. So those that were online only, which many institutions had shifted toward in uh, Canada in the, in, in the springtime, they, uh, those students weren't able to enter the country to begin in-person study this fall. They may have still enrolled, as did many, many students going to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, as well as the U.S., but because the border restrictions prohibited in, uh, students from coming in country if they were uh, not required to be on campus, uh, that affected Canada's intake this fall. We, we've seen some of that impact on that for their secondary school population and K through 12 education. Haven't seen the numbers for universities, uh, but the expectation is those numbers would be down for this fall as well. Uh, where you saw the two major destinations that had uh, uh, borders at least reopened uh, so that students uh, could hypothetically return or come for the first time to, to the, those countries to begin studies or continue studies of the US and the UK. Now, for the U.S., uh, we, we know that uh, the advantages of having our borders opened, uh, in theory, were, was a good thing because that allowed returning students, despite the challenge in, in July to prevent uh, students that were going to be hybrid or online from returning to campus, that was, that was rescinded and those students were able to return if they had valid visas already. Uh, then you also had the ability for new international students coming uh, to to come if it was um, if, if hybrid education was allowed uh, so that uh, did make a difference or in-person excuse me in-person education was allowed so that did make a difference for technically students being able to return to the United States or come for the first time uh, to start their programs now the problem was as we discussed last week in and in previous weeks where this has become an issue is that visa availability prohibited many of those students who wanted to come uh, from getting visa appointments because the greater majority of uh, U.S. embassies uh, were closed before the fall intake and are still closed, 70% as of last week uh, of U.S. embassies and consulates were not doing regular student visa appointments and doing emergency only at even some of our top destination markets or our source markets. So you see that 
in the U.S., we had the benefit of, yes, our borders were open, but the problem, the real problem in why students weren't coming in significant numbers this fall, not from, uh, not from a lack of desire to come, but frankly, a lack of ability to get visas, new students in particular, to arrive in person, uh, that prohibited many new students from being able to start their studies here this fall, even though borders were open. Uh, visa availability matters. Uh, where you see it worked uh, on the other, other side of the, uh, of the Atlantic is in the UK where you had uh, borders open, uh, so students were able to go uh, to arrive for, for study. Uh, where most university, almost all universities in the UK were online for their lectures, uh, the large lectures that they have. But they went uh, in, uh, they had in-person instruction for discussion sections, for labs. Uh, and that, frankly, is a benefit of the, of the British system in this kind of a search circumstance, where uh, because students are enrolled in particular academic programs, in under, particularly undergraduate study in the UK, uh, they, can, they can separate out uh, in residence halls, in teach in classes, uh, group students that are in particular cohorts for history, for medicine, for business, uh, where they're not going to be taking courses in other areas. So all students who are admitted for business uh, at one particular university, they can have separate pods, uh, classroom pods, where it's just them uh, meeting or in, in smaller groups because that's the nature of the academic system there. They'll have lectures in larger circumstances, which went online, much as it did in the U.S. here. And our hybrid uh, situation here with class, smaller classes and discussion sections being uh, in person uh, is much like how it developed in the UK. But uh, they were able to do, do it where it's kind of you have bubbles of students in different academic disciplines that are all together and are, uh, can be monitored and kept safe and tested and all of those uh, other things that need to happen. Uh, but that in person piece is what drove a lot of, uh, because it was available in the UK, in the US, having that hybrid in-person uh, educational program really drove students to those countries to come because they could, uh, in, at least theoretically could. So the research from IDP certainly backs that up in terms of uh, what, the, what students, offer holders, people who have admission letters uh, from uh, from institutions across these five major English-speaking destinations. They, it does show the, that, in, according to this Pi article, uh, increasingly positive perceptions of countries that have remained open during the pandemic. Uh, but many students will, are willing to change destinations to access face-to-face -face learning. Because ultimately that's why uh, that face-to-face -face learning, that uh, environment on campus, is why international students want the experience of studying abroad. Uh, it's, it's the value add of the education that they get from their professors in person, the relationships they're able to develop in person that can lead to networking opportunities down the road, but also the opportunity to be educated with students from other countries uh, from around the world, uh, to learn different perspectives. and. Perspectives is a word I'm going to be using a lot in 2021. Uh, it's certainly become something I focused on, having perspective, uh, understanding different perspectives of where students are coming from, how institutions position themselves globally. All of that matters. And for international students, they want that perspective of, of studying abroad, physically studying abroad. Uh, online degrees will have a place. There's no doubt that uh, there may be even increases in that. But how international students want face-to-face -face education is reinforced by this data. And that's, it really shows, as, as, the, as the Pi article uh, indicates, Simon Emmett, the CEO of uh, IDP Connect, said the research is a reminder of the ambition, resilience, and eagerness of international students to pursue their lifelong goals. And it's up to the institutions, frankly, to support them in that. And this is my, that's my take on it. Because international students want to know what's up and what the realities of the situation are. And that's a message that m many colleges in the United States in particular didn't do a great job of between April and September when there were decisions being made that uh, whether to, to say that they're open for in-person but actually they were really going online or going hybrid 
uh, that the realities on the ground force changes last minute or even after semesters began a week or two in, forcing to go from online to hybrid, or excuse me, from in-person to hybrid. So you see a lot of institutions uh, having to come to grips with communicating a message to your prospective audiences at a, a critical time that shows that you're, you're, you know what's happening, uh, that you want you want institutions want their students to know what's happening and that they're going to be supported once they're there and i think that's the message ultimately of the of the of the research that's uh, reflected here you have a country like new zealand that continues to lead uh, in international student perceptions as a uh, where student support and assistance is available uh, that uh, they're sub because they're not being able to get there uh, because of border closures, they're looking at other destinations now. And that's something that Australia is dealing with, uh, the UK is dealing with as well uh, in a, a more proactive piece, and we'll talk about that in a minute or two. But you see there's, there's risks associated uh, with being perceived as, uh, as a country uh, that's less open for business. And Australia and New Zealand currently have that. China certainly has that now. Uh, because of their policies on border closures. So in the end, what I think this IDP data really shows is that, that the institutions that communicate not only their institutional support that's available, but also the, the support that, in, that their country is, is providing to international students, uh, that is something that makes a difference, uh, makes a real difference in how you are perceived as an institution by your prospective student audiences, and that will continue to be the case. So the institutions that can communicate that effectively, not only institutionally but as a country, that value of w making sure that embassies are open and consulates are open, that they can get their visas, that they can be welcomed once they arrive in the country, that they're going to be taken care of on campus. When that touch, high touch kind of messaging approach is in baked into what you do, it will be a much easier transition for you in these in these difficult times to convince your prospective students and admitted students that hey you're still the right place for them uh, even though there's a lot going on in the world you can still be the best place for the, that student to uh, continue their education so i think the interest uh, is not just here it's still in the u.s uh, and the u.s does does see some uh, upticks in uh, an interest because of our willingness to be open here in the U.S. in this IDP data. So that I think will give us some momentum moving forward. And next week I have a piece out uh, for IDP Connect where I'll talk more about uh, the in influence of data in what we do and how what kind of data we need to be looking, looking at as we make our decisions. And this, this is going to be a piece of that puzzle. So moving on to the next question, question two. How must messaging change with international students? Now, uh, we've alluded to that a bit already with uh, talking about how institutions have responded over the summer months to uh, their prospective student audiences, their admitted students in particular that were hoping to come in the fall. Uh, how, did, how well did institutions keep them in the loop uh, during, uh, during the crisis uh, when there was still a lot of uncertainty uh, on a lot of different levels? On whether travel is going to be available, whether it was even possible to go for a visa appointment, whether uh, once they got in country, if their if their institution suddenly switched from online to uh, to from in person to online, what did that mean for their ability to stay in the country? How were messages like that communicated to uh, admitted students that were hoping to come? Uh, you see continuing fallout. We, that, those were certainly central to how well those your institution communicated. This, this summer uh, to eventually seeing success either in students actually being able to physically get to the U.S. in terms of students that said, okay, I'm going to start online because I know that uh, you, based on what you're telling me, I will be able to come in person soon, uh, or I'm going to defer for a year and I'm trusting you to keep me in the loop as to what's going on. Uh, that last group is absolutely critical to institutional success moving forward. When you think about one of the pieces of data that we saw uh, during IEW that was fairly significant is uh, during that fall snapshot survey uh, of 700 institutions at IIE and other institutions, other organizations were able to compile, you saw 40,000 students uh, defer 
admission. And we don't know whether that's for j till January or for a full year until next uh, fall 2021. But to have that significant a number from f 700 institutions, so 40,000 students out there that are kind of on the line, they're taking a gap year, they're doing service projects, whatever it might be, uh, those students are really uh, central to success moving forward. They are, are what Alan Goodman called in the Open Doors briefing, the pent up demand uh, that, is ex that does exist and will continue to exist in the coming months as those that weren't able to study or just stopped even applying last year when the pandemic hit that might have come last fall that are now looking, okay, well, maybe things are calming down enough, the vaccines are coming out sh soon. So uh, by next fall, maybe I'll still be able to get to, maybe I will be able to get to campus. But those, the communication from universities to these students that are now um, in, uh, in, in a kind of a holding pattern and to prospective students that are thinking about applying this year, you, you could have a cohort that could be much larger next fall, that certainly than if you were online only and couldn't take new students this fall. Uh, you will be in a situation next fall where there'll be a lot of pent up demand and uh, hopefully a bumper crop bumper crop of international students able to enroll. But key to that success is how you have adapted your messaging to those students. And there's a lot of different levels to this and over the coming weeks and months I'm going to be talking about what I call the six P's of uh, strategic international enrollment management uh, in terms of recruitment uh, of international students and you know the four P's of marketing uh, that are all, have been around for decades, but getting specific about international education, enrollment management, you and, and from a strategic perspective, what we'll be talking about is some of the ways um, that messaging needs to be adaptable and uh, to circumstances. And certainly the circumstances over the last nine months with the pandemic have uh, totally upended um, what our norms are. Uh, in terms of uh, admitted student events, in terms of scholarship deadlines, in terms of uh, admi admission criteria even with tests uh, going optional, uh, to, uh, many schools becoming test optional, other factors along the way that have changed. You see that there are some institutions that are still completely tone deaf to the realities of what international students are facing right now. Uh, and one of those is a school in Texas that will, shall remain nameless that has uh, just told students that had been admitted and received scholarship offers that they um, must begin taking courses in the spring if they were admitted for fall and if they don't either online or in person uh, that uh, their their scholarship will be revoked now this is uh, perhaps uh, makes sense and that students uh, that will eventually come to campus, uh, we'll see, okay, I'll, I'll go, maybe if I can't make it there, I'll go online, but I really want to be in person, but I'm, I can't get a visa, so what am I going to do? There are some real issues in this, but the, that message of, we admitted you, we gave you a scholarship, and we're giving you a semester off because we know that maybe you can't get here and, and such, but if you don't enroll, you're going to lose a scholarship. And that just is so tone deaf. Uh, and I really struggle understanding the rationale behind that. And this is, uh, again, covered in, uh, covered in this article I'm posting a link to, uh, but it's also referencing the Pi News got this letter as well, uh, that from a prospective student, that uh, it's a distinguished presidential scholarship that this, this cohort has received. And there may be other examples of, of institutions that are, are telling students if they don't enroll online, they're not going to get the scholarship. I get that. But that's it, the, the, mess, the way the message is conveyed is just, it's abysmal. And it shows a t complete lack of understanding of what's going on in the world. Uh, with, in this particular case, you had a Nepali student who's in a country that he was lucky enough to, that he, he got the scholarship great, uh, that uh, his real challenge is getting the visa. Um, even with the scholarship, that can be a, a, a particular roadblock uh, to getting a visa in uh, from the embassy in Kathmandu. They've cut way down on their uh, on their visas issued to prospective students from Nepal coming to the U.S. Uh, because they feel that they've got no reason to come back. Uh, they think they're all flight risks. 
uh, or non showing immigrant intent in, in, in reality that they don't have a reason to come back. Uh, whether they do or not, that's uh, the, the embassy, in Con uh, embassy in Kathmandu has made that decision. Uh, I remember being there in December of, uh, or late November, December of 2016, and having consulate officer, uh, the embassy consular and visa officers basically say, hey, we don't even look at bank statements anymore because they're all, almost all fraudulent. Uh, you can buy them off the street corner uh, a block from the embassy. Uh, so that, 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 that attitude has certainly continued and have led to uh, ex 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 certainly extreme uh, visa denial rates from the institution I was working for at the time from Nepal. Uh, well over 90% were, were being rejected. Whereas the previous year we'd had 78% uh, uh, admitted uh, with visas, so that 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 messaging to to a student in a country that has been struggling to secure visas, that is questioning, well, if I if I can't get a visa, I could study online, but I don't know, that's not worth it for me uh, to study online uh, because I I want the experience on campus. So it really reflects. Uh, the uh, again tone deafness of institutions that say that uh, that a pull, will pull a scholarship for students in situations and circumstances in certain countries where getting a visa is not the easiest thing in the world. So uh, that they that they say they must be enrolled full time, either in person or online, in order to re to receive that scholarship. Well, yeah, you got to be en en enrolled to to get a scholarship, but basically you're not going to it's going to be pulled uh, if you don't. Uh, and that's uh, not allowing them to defer that. At least the language in the letters, uh, whether there's additional information that, uh, that hasn't been made aware, uh, made available to, to the press on this, uh, that's, that may be. But the, the, if that's the initial message a student gets, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be very encouraging, uh, encouraged by that uh, to, to continue uh, pursuing that, at that institution. Uh, so it's really messaging must change to your circumstances. Uh, we talked about what happened over the summer, where uh, particularly when in July there was a big kerfuffle with uh, with DHS on not allowing uh, online or hybrid returning students to come back. So if if your international office wasn't communicating effectively to to your current students at that point, and there there, there, was, there was a gap, and students were felt felt like they were left out of the out of the out of the mix and weren't communicated to effectively about what the situation was and what their where they stood uh, with their enrollment in the coming term that matters uh, and it matters how that message is, is conveyed as well so messaging has to change and in periods where there's a lot of uncertainty about what's it really like for for, for an international student in a time of a global pandemic if it's just the institution that's messaging out to students that's not, that's not the best approach, because if you if if it's all yes we're open yes we're, we're our, our borders are open our campus is open we're uh, doing regular testing all of that if you, you can have have that message gone out for the from the president of your institution from your international office from your admission office but it doesn't have the same impact as it would if it's coming from a current student and this whole idea of peers. Uh, how important peers are to prospective students in the mix of uh, communication is absolutely essential, uh, particularly so in a time of pandemic. So what you see is the value of current students and in being involved as part of the messaging out to prospective students. It's even more important now uh, in this day and age. So last question that we'll, we'll touch on very briefly, um, and this goes back to what I was, I was talking about earlier, about having a global perspective, uh, a perspective on what's going on outside your own campus, outside your own country, as it relates to international student recruitment. Now, what does competing for students mean globally? First, for my US colleagues, it means you have to be aware of what your competitor countries are doing, not just your competitor colleges in your state, in your region, that are also going after the same students you are. But it's other students, as the IDP data su suggests, that have offers from multiple countries that are considering multiple destination countries for their study. If your messaging doesn't reflect that, 
uh, and that, that you are aware that these students have choices, uh, that there are other options for them. So it's not just about you promoting your own institution, but it's also about promoting the United States as a destination. That is now part of your responsibilities and probably should have been for, for years. But if you're not doing it, it, you're missing opportunities. And I'll share a couple of articles here. One, uh, it's an article uh, in University World News from a UK perspective, is could Joe Biden's election in the US be bad for UK higher ed? They take that perspective and have that kind of tack on things that where you see, uh, you see what other institution, other countries are now saying, we need to adapt our messaging to to compete against what may be a more favorable destination, again, the US to the UK. Even though the UK has just had a great fall and is seeing great success because they, were, they remained open, they had uh, in-person small classes, but they were doing primarily lectures online. Uh, that one reason UK had a great fall is because they had their visa services open up and running in their major destination markets. That wasn't the case in the US for students looking to come here. So they did really well, but they're, they're now having, having cause for concern about, well, Biden's election is going to mean uh, it's going to hurt us uh, in the UK, even though they've just had a great, uh, great fall. So being aware of that is important. Uh, another example, Australia is now concerned about losing students to, to Canada as a result of their uh, concern for, um, the, obviously they've had the closed borders and uh, there's been a number of stories about uh, international student support in Australia is not as good as it, as, as it is in other places. Canada's seen as a, a real example and there's an article out of, the, out of Australia looking at how Canada is perhaps a better destination. Um, and Australian institutions need to be aware of that. So that kind of global competitiveness is essential. Other countries get it. We need to start getting it if we haven't already. And we'll talk more in the future weeks about, uh, about how that impacts us in the United States and how we view the rest of the world uh, when it comes to students coming to our, our country. So for now, uh, that's it for this week's edition of the Midweek Roundup, December 2nd, 2020. I'm looking forward to catching up with you again next Wednesday, December 9th, uh, for another edition of the Roundup. Until then, have a great day.